Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone so, so much for joining us for our first of eight press conferences here at the 241st meeting of the American Astronomical Society. It is roughly 1015 AM PST here in beautiful, sunny Seattle. Just kidding. Um, and <laughs> I have to say this has been, 2022 is a very big year for astronomy. And one of those really big stories in astronomy this past year was of course the long awaited release of the first images from JWST. So I am so thrilled to announce that our first of our eight press conferences is going to be entirely dedicated to those results from JWST. Um, so I would like to introduce myself. I am Carrie Hensley. I am the Deputy AAS Press Officer, and I am assisted today by our AAS Media Fellow, Ben Cassess, who is helping in the back here, as well as our Astrobytes Media Intern, Zili Shen, who's up here in the front, and they'll be helping us with the Q&A here today. I invite you to silence your cell phone or anything else that might make noise during the press conference. Um, and you should also be on the lookout for any of the several press releases that will be released today associated with this morning's press conference. And you can find those on the AAS Press Twitter channel, um, the AAS.org website, as well as the Slack channel for um, this, the press-conferences Slack channel. And those will also be added to the press kit later in the day. So... If this is your first press conference or your 40th, I'm going to go over the ground rules very quickly. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists. Um, we'll hear from them in order, starting from here down to Vivian at the end. Um, and we won't have any time for Q&A or applause in between those presentations. We're going to save all that for the end and ask our presenters questions all at the same time. If you are watching the um, presentation online, we invite you to queue your questions using the Q&A feature on Zoom, and we will make sure to get to those at the end. So as I said, um, this press conference is going to entirely deal with JWST uh, observations of galaxies. So we have very cleverly named it Eyes on Galaxies with JWST. Our first present presenter will be Jehan Kartaltepe from Rochester Institute of Technology, speaking on an early look at the evolution of galaxy structure at redshifts of three to nine with JWST. Next will be James Rhodes from the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, speaking on finding peas in the early universe with JWST. Next, Philip Appleton from Caltech will speak on zooming in on sh the shocked and turbulent intergalactic medium and Stefan's quintet with J JWST and ALMA. Next, Hao Jing Yan from the University of Missouri, Columbia, will speak on a large number of candidate galaxies at a redshift of 11 to 20, revealed by the JWST early release observations. And finally, Vivian Yu from the University of California, Irvine, will speak on unveiling the dusty hearts of galaxies with JWST. Um, I am really excited to hear from these people, so I won't make you hear from me anymore. Uh, Jehan, would you like to come up? So, sorry, with that mouse on the other screen, that does definitely make it hard. All right, over to you. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to have the opportunity to talk to you all today about some of our early results uh, with JWST imaging. So it was nearly 100 years ago when Edwin Hubble first put together the Hubble tuning fork diagram, what we now know as the Hubble sequence. So we know galaxies in our nearby universe tend to fall into two different types. There are galaxies that are disk galaxies with spiral arms, like our own Milky Way, and there are galaxies that are more rounded or elliptical in shape. In addition to these, there's a small fraction of galaxies that are irregular and they don't fit into these categories. With Hubble the telescope, we've learned that this basic scheme was already in place 4 billion years ago and even 11 billion years ago. That is, many galaxies had disk-like features and many had spheroid features already. 
With JWST, we can push this to an even higher frontier since we have rest frame optical imaging that allows us to probe to even greater distances. So we would like to understand what galaxies were like at even earlier times. When did those first spiral arms or bulges in galaxies actually form? In short, when did the Hubble sequence actually begin? That's something we don't yet know. And we also want to understand what physical processes were responsible for driving their morphological transformation over the age of the universe. We conducted this study using early imaging of the Sears field. Sears is one of the 13 early release science programs that had data taken back in June of 2022. This field has been extensively studied with Hubble, so we could do a direct comparison of what galaxies look like with JWST and with Hubble. Uh, this image shows a mosaic of those first June near cam pointings. You can see all four pointings lined up here. And here is a selection of what just a few of these high redshift galaxies look like. In total, we analyzed 850 galaxies at a redshift greater than three that were also detected in Hubble imaging so that we could compare them directly. Each of these galaxies was classified by three team members where each person had to answer whether they saw a disk, whether they saw a sphero, yes. Or and I forgot to, I apologize to you. I forgot to uh, introduce you. Um, this is Haley Roberts from University of Colorado. <laughs> For Haley. All right, we're going to use the, the folks on Zoom here, or you can come up to the stand, whichever you prefer. Can we go to Zoom? Yeah. <laughs> it stopped. Maybe we're okay. Okay. Let's back up a little bit. <laughs> So each of our classifiers were asked to determine whether they saw evidence for a disk in the galaxy, a spheroid, or irregular features. And they could choose multiple of these categories because galaxies are complex and they don't necessarily fall into just one box. So this image here shows a sampling of galaxies at three different redshift bins in all of these different combinations. So, so for example, a galaxy could have just a disk, but it could also have a disk with a spheroid if there's evidence for a strong bulge in the center. We also compared our visual morphologies with several different automated measures as well. <laughs> to briefly summarize our findings, here we look at the fraction of galaxies of various morphological types, you can see examples here on the right, as a function of redshift. So first here on the left is what we know from existing Hubble imaging. From Hubble, we knew that galaxies with disks make up about 45% of galaxies at redshift of three, and that fraction declines with redshift, particularly, particularly at a redshift of greater than four. We see similar things with galaxies with spheroids and galaxies with irregular. This decline is largely driven by the large fraction of galaxies that are unclassifiable or unresolved in the Hubble imaging. They were just too faint or too small for us to be able to see anything. When we look at the same classifications with the JWST data, essentially everything jumps up. All of the fractions are now higher. So disks make up 60% of galaxies between redshifts three to five, and then slowly declines to about 30 to 40%. Spheroids and irregulars make up a roughly constant fraction across all of these redshifts. There are a number of reasons for the changes in morphologies we see between Hubble and JWST. One is the increased resolution of JWST. We can now see finer details that allow us to see the structure more clearly. Another is that the infrared capabilities allow us to see the rest frame optical light at higher redshifts. And the other is the improved depth. The high sensitivity of the near cam instrument allows us to see faint features that we simply couldn't see before. So this is a montage of a few different galaxies that have di very different morphologies between Hubble imaging and JWST imaging. So on the left is the Hubble image. In the middle are three different JWST images. And on the right is a color uh, composite of those. And so for example, if we just look at the second object here in this row, if you only looked at the Hubble imaging, you'd probably say this is a spheroid. It's small, it's round, it's compact. You don't see very much structure. But with the JWST imaging, the surrounding disk around this galaxy becomes clear. So we're able to see a lot more of these features. 
So to summarize, we see a wide diversity of morphologies in galaxies all the way out to the highest redshifts we've been able to study. There's a large fraction of galaxies with disks ranging from 60% at redshift of three uh, down to you know, 30 to 40% at the highest redshifts. But there's also a large fraction that have irregular features, roughly 40 to 50% across the entire redshift range. And so note that there's overlap between these. So these disks aren't like today's disks. They're not today's Milky Way. They're different. They're turbulent, they're messy, and we need to study them more. The changes we see relative to Hubble are largely driven by the increased depth, the increased resolution, and the fact that we're finally probing the rest frame optical out to these highest redshifts. So this is only the beginning. We looked at 850 galaxies from the June data. Now there's more Sears data that have been taken. There are images in other fields. And so we can really start to look at samples of thousands of galaxies at these redshifts and really start to quantify when the first disks and bulges were able to form in our universe. Thank you. Hello everyone. I'm James Rhodes from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, and today I wanted to tell you about some extremely interesting galaxies in the early universe that we've been studying with JWST. And I'm also going to tell you about a connection between these galaxies and the rare interesting class of nearby galaxies called green peas. So the story begins with the very first JWST deep field, the image of the galaxy cluster SMAC 0723. And when the JWST early release observations team looked at this image, they identified a trio of objects that have the infrared colors expected for galaxies in the very distant universe. When you zoom up on them, this is what they look like. And crucially, in addition to the images of these, the early release observations program included spectroscopy and these three objects were observed with the near-spec instrument, which provided the crucial data set for our analysis. So when near-spec looked at these, it, it breaks up the light into its component colors. And this is what these spectra look like. Each of these red wiggly lines is the spectrum of one of those three galaxies. And you see the line goes up in specific places. These are called emission lines. These are wavelengths where much of the energy that the galaxy is putting out are concentrated into these very narrow spectral features. And this is very different from a spectrum of the sun or an incandescent bulb, which is a smooth, continuous rainbow. What we learned from seeing these strong emission lines is that much of the light from these galaxies is coming from glowing gas clouds rather than directly from the surfaces of stars. And in addition, you can learn about the composition of these clouds because each chemical element has its own sort of fingerprint, a set of lines that it produces, a set of wavelengths that you can recognize once you compensate for the stretching of the universe that moves these spectra to the red. And looking at these spectra, we see that these objects have oxygen and hydrogen, and also neon and helium. And when my collaborators and I saw these for the first time, we looked at them and said, hey, these look very much like the spectra of these green pea galaxies that we've been studying for a few years. We better do a study comparing them. So here's what the green pea spectra look like on the same scale. And you can see, I hope, that there are a great deal of similarity between these two sets of objects. Before I go on further, I'd like to say a little more about what green peas are and why we've been studying them anyway. So green pea galaxies are a class of rare nearby galaxy that were first identified by citizen science volunteers who were working as part of the Galaxy Zoo project. And what those volunteers did was to look through um, false color Sloan digital sky survey images at images of individual galaxies. And among the large number of spirals and ellipticals, they found a rare class of these small round green things, which they dubbed green peas. And these have several unique and interesting properties. First, much of the light comes from glowing gas, as I just outlined. Second, they're quite small. Third, their light is dominated by the output of young stars. And fourth, their chemical composition is relatively pristine. A lot of hydrogen, not too much of oxygen and carbon and other heavier elements. 
And these are all properties that are shared by early galaxies. So coming back to the JWST spectra, what do we actually learn about these objects? So the first thing we can do is to compare various lines of oxygen, and the ratios of these lines tell us that the gas in these distant galaxies is very hot, at least double the temperature that we would find in a galaxy like our own. And once you know that the gas is hot, you can go back and look at a different combination of lines, and you learn by comparing the brightness of the oxygen and hydrogen lines and knowing the temperature, you learn that there's actually not very much oxygen in these galaxies. We see the oxygen, but the amount is as little as 2% of what's in a galaxy like our own in the most distant of those three JWST targets. And that's possibly the lowest oxygen abundance we know of in any galaxy so far. There are other similarities too in the appearance of these galaxies. Um, on the left is one of the green peas whose spectra I showed you, and on the right is the most distant of those JWST objects scaled to about the same physical scale. And you can see they're both very small and you know, they both have very intense star formation activity. This makes them young galaxies in every sense. So to summarize, we found what may be the most chemically primitive galaxy yet among the first three spectra of galaxies in the cosmic dawn from JWST. Green pea galaxies in the nearby universe provide a comparable set of objects in our cosmic backyard, but they're very much rarer nearby. And we can use these modern peas to better understand their distant counterparts. And I just want to give a quick shout out. There will be a little further detail on these green peas and their relation to high redshift galaxies in Sangeeta Malhotra's plenary later on. Thanks. Okay, so my name is uh, Phil Appleton from IPAC Caltech, and I'm going to zoom in on some very interesting regions in the turbulent intergalactic medium in, one, in a spectacular system, Stefan's Quintet, using ERO observations from JWST and ALMA observations. So let's get to know the Quintet, for those of you who might have, uh, don't know it. Um, it's actually, there are five bright galaxies in this uh, very small area. And one of them we're just going to completely ignore because it's a foreground object and is uh, not part of the system. And of the four there, there's even a smaller one outside of the field. So the quintet is still back. Um, but uh, the most interesting object is this intruder galaxy that's shown in yellow near the center. And that is crashing into the, the group at about 700 to 1,000 kilometers per second and creating a giant shock wave which is passing through the group. A shock wave is produced ahead of an object traveling faster than the speed of sound in a gaseous medium. In our case, the object is the intruder galaxy, and the gaseous medium is gas in the intergalactic medium of the group. And there's previous evidence from uh, Chandra um, that this shock wave has heated gas up to millions of degrees. And this is a, a Hubble image of the group. And in blue, you can see X-ray emission coming from uh, this along this shock. And I, I mark this so just to give you a feel for where the shock roughly is it's, it's shown here. So these early results were consistent with the high speed collision uh, between the intruder and the intergalactic medium. In 2006, our team using Spitzer uh, discovered a remarkable fact that within the shock and mixed with the X-ray emission is a huge amount of fragile uh, H2 molecules radiating in the infrared. And these molecules would not normally survive shock waves traveling faster than 30 to 50 kilometers per second. So how can this be reconciled with a shock wave that's traveling close to a thousand kilometers per second? So the mystery of in my presentation is to try to solve why most of the most of the powerful energy flowing out of the shock is coming from these very fragile molecules, which are easily destroyed. How can they form? How can they continue to survive in a violent environment? 
And the solution, as you see, is that uh, one possible solution is there's a clumpy, the, the original medium that the shockwave hit was clumpy. It formed dense clumps of very cold gas. And these clumps took the brunt of the fast flowing hot gas behind the shock and shattered these, the clouds were then shattered into tiny cloudlets, which then were slowly accumulated into the violent flow and started to emit uh, their uh, infrared radiation. <clears throat> so to solve this, we're going to zoom in on uh, the beautiful early release observations. And I thank the team uh, for releasing those early and new ALMA observations. So we we'll use the James Webb to not just look at the same warm H2 molecules in the 10 micron band um, that was released, but also ionized hydrogen heated to um, something like uh, 10,000 degrees. And also we'll use the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, which is sensitive to carbon monoxide emission which is a tracer of very cold molecular hydrogen in the system. So we can't talk about this without showing some of the images. JWST, the beautiful images here. This is a composite of NOCAM and uh, MIRI. And what you can see is that the structure that we saw um, with Spitzer is, is seen very clearly here in these MIRI bands. And if you just look at the MIRI bands only on the right, uh, green is the 10 micron molecular hydrogen band. Oops, sorry. Um, the dust is red, is red and also background galaxies. And then there's uh, some other uh, molecules which we don't need to worry about here at this in this talk. Um, so let, let's zoom in on the three special regions. We, we observed three special regions with ALMA. Of course, this was before JWST was launched. And so we chose... Uh, three regions, one up in the north where there's a lot of star formation. And what I want you to look at is green is the warm molecular hydrogen, red is the cold ALMA data. So up in the north, we see what looks like a small dwarf galaxy forming there. It's been known for some time that there's possibly a dwarf. This one in another region shows a possible cloud-cloud collision between two systems. And in the very center, in the shock itself, we see something that looks like a head tails system with a shell. And if we look at it, each of these regions we studied tells its own story. I don't have time to talk about the others. I'm just gonna concentrate on the one that's in the main shock. And <clears throat> what does this tell us? So let's concentrate on this. And what we see is that in the image on the left there, you see warm gas. This is the warm molecular hydrogen from JWST. And then the contours show the cold uh, molecular gas from ALMA. And what we see is there's a head tail structure with these clumps. And it, the ALMA data also gives us uh, kinematics. So we know that the, the, the cold gas clouds are quite turbulent. And the, also the motions seem to stream away from the head. And this is very reminiscent of the computer models of what happens when you have a strong wind impinging upon a dense molecular cloud producing this structure at the bottom, which looks remarkably similar to what we see. So we have a toy model to explain the abundance of the warm H2 in the shock wave. And uh, if you bear with me, uh, first thing that happens is the fast shock wave coming into this filament of gas is striking a clumpy filament. That's very important. The hot gas, the, the um, the, the, the result of the collision is to heat some of the gas up to very, very high temperatures, and other places it compresses it to form cold clumps behind the shock. And then the violent flow that comes uh, from this blast wave coming through, it begins to shatter the, the, these dense clouds into tiny droplets. And then the, cl the, the cloudlets are shielded from the full impact of the flow, but they slowly get dragged into the hot flow and start to mix with it turbulently. And that mixing is what drives little tiny shocks into these tiny clouds and they radiate like crazy in the infrared. So the mystery is partially solved. The intergalactic medium of Stefan's Quintet is not uniform, but is a complex mix of warm, cold, and ionized gas. All three Alma study regions have different warm and cold structures. One of the regions, field six, provides a clue as to the mystery of why the main shock glows so brightly in infrared emission, in these, the glow of this, these fragile molecules. 
The dense clouds observed by Almer are formed behind the shock. These cold clouds are exposed to the full violence of the flow of this hot gas in the aftermath of the shock. Then we see the gas in x-rays. They... <clears throat> and it causes them to start to shatter into tiny cloudlets. And because the cloudlets are partially protected by the large cold clouds, they're more gently drawn into the fast flow and they're slowly accelerated and buffeted and turbulently heated. And they produce a sort of a foggy tail of warm infrared radiating H2 gas behind these dense clumps. Future spectroscopic observations with JWST and more extensive ALMER observations will allow us to test this idea by because JWS, JWST will allow us to actually measure the motions in the warm gas. At the moment, we can only measure the motions in the cold gas. They show some turbulence, but we expect the warm gas to be much uh, more turbulent probably because it's being pulled into this flow. You can view the full scientific paper of this on uh, Astro PH server, which is coming, the paper's coming out tomorrow and you can contact me there. Thank you. Okay, thank you guys. Uh, it's my pleasure to present here. I'm Hao Jing Yan uh, from University of Missouri, Columbia. I wanted to start by thanking my collaborators. Uh, one of them actually here is here in the room, uh, Dr. Gio Ma, who's sitting over there, who's currently at uh, UMass. And without his timely reduction of the data, uh, we won't be able to uh, produce our science so quickly. Um, this is my official title uh, of the presentation, but I think that for the purpose of this press conference, I wanted to change it to this one. So first set of uh, JWST deep data revealed a large number of candidate galaxies at 200 to 400 million years after the Big Bang, which is long. But I think that uh, this, um, well, uh, you know, captures the, uh, the essence of our discovery better. Um, all right, so um, I... Uh, talk about ratio of 11 to 20, right? So I need to explain this for a little bit. So in cosmology, ratio of well, Z is related to distance and it is related to uh, the age of the universe. So we know that we are living in a expanding universe. And this has uh, uh, two points here. One is that um, um, galaxies outside of our Milky Way, they are flying away from us. So that's point number one. Point number two is that uh, the further they are away, the faster they are moving away. Okay, so number two. So this means that the large receding velocity, large receding speed um, is large distance. And we know that galaxies, they emit light, right? And uh, in, in physics, we know that uh, a light emitting source moving away from us will make their blue light appear um, red to us. So this is what we call redshift. So the large, the larger the receding speed means, uh, you know, larger, uh, larger redshift. That is a high redshift. So from here we know high redshift is a larger distance. Now, very importantly, um, the speed of light is not unlimited; it's finite. Okay, so that uh, well, we from here we know that uh, uh, it takes a longer time for the light from a further away object to travel to us. So larger distance means uh, long light traveling time. So combining all this, now we know high redshift, high Z, means uh, long light traveling time, means a young universe. So this is where our story begins. And you might have all seen this um, um, picture before from many years ago, uh, which you know pretty much illustrates the timeline of the universe. The Big Bang, the beginning of everything is here, corresponding to redshift of infinity. While we are here, present day, corresponding to ratio of zero, um, the age of the universe uh, in between is uh, 13.77 billion years. And the uh, ratio of the 11 to 20 is right here, right? It's this narrow range, corresponding to uh, 400 to 200 million years right after the Big Bang. So this is, um, uh, I crossed out that thing here, but now uh, this is beyond the scope of our story. But, uh, okay, so... Our our discovery was made uh, in this field, uh, uh, S max uh, 0, 7, uh, 23 minus 73. And this is pretty much the first set of uh, deep um, JWST uh, exposures. And um, this is the full color composite of the entire field. 
And within this field, well, we found uh, 87 candidate galaxies at a ratio of the larger than, um, larger than 11. The data were released um, uh, last year, July 13th, and uh, we made public of our um, sample within about two weeks. And I need to emphasize that uh, this is pretty much uh, the, the first large sample of candidate galaxies at the ratio of the larger than 11, which is beyond the reach of Hubble Space Telescope. So you now might be asking, you know, how we can find those, right? So uh, we find them by looking for their unique signature, which we call the Lyman break. Say a galaxy is right over here and you observer is here. The space between you and the galaxy is not empty. Actually, it is a field of, full of uh, uh, neutral hydrogen clouds. Uh, those clouds, they create absorption lines, right? And uh, if you have large enough distances, then you have, uh, you're getting into um, a larger enough number of hydrogen clouds, then um, those clouds, they will create numerous line absorptions, uh, effectively remove the uh, UV part of the spectrum, UV part of the emission, so creating the break. And by looking at those breaks, oh yeah, uh, it doesn't work as I expected, but in any case, okay, so this is uh, how, how we find high range of galaxies, uh, well, high Z galaxies. We use a standard technique called um, the dropout selection because of the, uh, let me display, let me let me play this, play this, uh, is it moving? Yes, it is moving. All right, so uh, because of this alignment break, you can see that, um, well, um, it will make a high range of galaxy very weak or even invisible in the blue band, but um, it will appear in the red, redder band, okay? So the higher the redshift, the, the redder the break. So this is how we can find them by targeting this very unique signature. And uh, this is where the Hubble Space Telescope's hunt for high Z galaxies stops, okay? It's right over here. And um, this is where we picked up, okay? And uh, we are looking for uh, dropouts from the 150W, 200W, and 277W. And so this is the field, the entire field. And uh, those 87 candidate galaxies, uh, their positions are highlighted by those uh, circles of uh, different colors. And let me give you one example here. This is a 150W dropout. Uh, and you can see that it's uh, not visible in this very blue band. Uh, it's very weak here, but it's pretty clear in the red bands. Okay? And this roughly corresponds to a ratio of the, uh, 11 to 15. And um, going to higher redshift, we have a 200W dropout, and you can see that it's dropping out from more blue bands, and uh, well, it still show up in the uh, red bands, right? And this roughly corresponds to a redshift of uh, uh, 15 to 20. And this is one step further, 277W dropouts. And you can see it's dropping out from even more blue bands, but still detected in this uh, two reddest band. So in total, we have 87 of those. Now you might be asking, right? So uh, isn't that the natural for JWST to push to um, Z larger than 11? Well, the answer is both yes and no. Yes, well, pretty much everyone expect that uh, JW will find galaxies at larger than 11. But no, because almost no one, I would say probably except myself, uh, very few people actually uh, will expect that uh, JWST will find so many candidate galaxies at such a long duration of within just one shot. This is just one shot, right? People will be telling you that, uh, well, you'll be lucky if you can find maybe one such galaxy in one, in one field, but we found so many. So the discrepancy is so obvious. Uh, but a word of caution, though, um, regardless of um, uh, you know how much our candidate galaxies look like in you know, a Z larger than eleven, they remain candidates until further spectroscopic confirmation. They are still candidates, okay? And uh, you, I wouldn't be surprised if some of them turn out to be low redshift uh, interlopers, what we call contaminants. Okay? Uh, this is totally natural. But the whole point, the point is that uh, even if just a small fraction of those candidate galaxies turn out to be really at the ratio of the larger than 15, uh, larger than 11, then our previously favored picture of a galaxy formation in the early universe must be revised. Uh, so I'll stop here and uh, leave my first, uh, last slide here. Okay, okay, thank you very much.
Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Vivian Yu from the University of California, Irvine. And today I'm excited to share with you some of our new results from our goals JWST ERS program that targets the dusty centers of nearby galaxies as pub recently published in an FJ letter. And specifically, I'll be talking about this really cool galaxy NGC 7469 in this merging system you can see here. So one reason that my study focuses on 7469 is that this spiral galaxy harbors an active supermassive black hole at its center, and it is surrounded by a ring of where intense star formation is happening. And so it's an ideal laboratory for us to understand whether and how black holes actually influence the st uh, stellar and gaseous content of its host galaxy. So here is 7469 and its companion uh, towards the... Uh, towards uh, the, the upper part with which it's going to merge one day. Um, and this is seen in optical light with uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. So you can see that there are dark dust lanes that are showing where the dust is obscuring visible light from stars. And here is the, um, the uh, a view from JWST, which presents a much smoother version of that light profile now that the dust is no longer in the way. And the red filter in this composite image uh, even highlights sites of very young star formation that were previously obscured by the dust that we couldn't see before. And so while these images are spectacular to look at, what I'm personally most excited about is actually um, JWST's capability uh, with the mid-infrared instrument, or MIRI. So as you may know, MIRI is a sensitive mid-infrared uh, integral field spectroscopic instrument, the first that we've put in space. So while NGC 7469 has previously been studied by uh, Spitzer Space Telescope, which is, you know, has a great legacy on its own, and it's taught us a great deal about the cool uh, atomic gas and, and molecular gases, and also dust grains, um, that's, uh, you can see in this spectrum, uh, image in this, in this wave, uh, mid infrared wavelength range, you can see that JWST actually builds on that legacy with five to 25 times the spectral resolution and really shows us what all the cool gases are present. Um, uh, and you can see that, you know, uh, there are a lot of features that were identified from this uh, spectrum that was just extracted from the central region of the galaxy. And we can also see how that these gases are distributed as well. Uh, previously with Spitzer or any other single slit spectroscopic instruments, all you get is a single spectrum. Now with MIRI offers is that they, you get three dimensional data cubes where we essentially get an image at every slice of the spectrum. So this gives us a clear view of how the different gas species at different temperatures and different ionization states may be actually distributed. So here I'm showing the flux map of three different gases, uh, iron in the blue, molecular hydrogen in green, and argon in orange. And what you immediately notice is that these maps look different. Uh, the iron and the argon maps, they look pretty similar to each other, and they are uh, both tracing the, the ring of star formation that I was telling you about. So the distance from here to here is about a thousand light years across. And on the other hand, the, um, oh, and you can also see that the, the complete structure in the ring itself is highlighting sites of intense star formation that I mentioned. So on the other hand, the molecular hydrogen uh, is much more concentrated at the center and also in the space in between the black hole and the ring itself. And some of these filaments also trace the inner parts of the spiral arms that the gas is feeding into the central supermassive black hole. So with an integral field spectrograph like MIRI and with sufficient spectral resolution, if you pace through that data cube, what you can also get is the detection, detection of the motion of that gas. So here again is that map of the argon um, gas I was just showing and the panel right next to it it's going to show you a movie of what the channel maps uh, of the gas look like, and I'll play it uh, a few times. It's not showing, oh, it is, okay, good. <laughs> uh, so this actually tells us that the gas moving toward us is on the left, lower left panel, and the um, gas moving away from us is on the upper right. So this is how we can actually tell that the ring of the star formation is not just static, but it's actually rotating. And one really interesting feature in this region that we can detect is a magnesium five line, which is called a coronal line because of its uh, high ionization potential, meaning that it can only be excited by something very, very energetic, like the coronal region in the um, uh, surrounding this uh, active black hole in the center of this galaxy. So here I've divided up the central region of 7469 into a three by three grid, extracting a spectrum from each cell. 
And for many of the spectra here that correspond to those cells uh, in that grid, you can see this asymmetric line profile. Uh, you can see that there's more gas on the blue side, on, on the left side of the center line, than there are on the red side, on the or right, right side. And this means that the gas is blue shifted. It means that it's the gas is moving away from us. And this is giving us direct evidence that the supermassive black hole in the center of this galaxy is driving winds um, uh, at us. So without going into too much details, we also found evidence for shocks in this inner uh, interstellar medium region. So the very simple cartoon that we've put together for the heart of 7469 is that inside a rotating star forming ring, the active supermassive black hole is driving a very, very fast wind toward us. And this wind is sending shocks into the surrounding medium and also destroying some small dust grains uh, in, in the process. So having this very detailed picture of what goes on in the centers of nearby galaxies is important because it allows us to understand how black holes and galaxies co-evolve, how they evolve together. And this highlights the important role that black holes uh, is plays in galaxy evolution. So I'd like to just wrap up by saying that this is one system we're able to study in such stunning detail using data from JWST. And thus far, we've received data from three of these galaxy systems that are at different stages of merging. And so far, they've all made pictures of the month uh, on the ESA web blog for obvious reasons. Um, and uh, I'm happy to report that the first set of papers from our goals collaboration have all been published or accepted as of last week. And between our ERS and GL1 uh, programs, we have several more galaxies to go and many more discoveries to make. So please stay tuned. And if you like more information on the paper I just presented, please feel free to see the press release um, from the QR code here. Thank you. All right, excellent. Thank you so much to all our presenters. I'm going to stop our screen sharing here and hopefully our friends on. Oh, I don't know why that's still up. <laughs> okay, well, that's just how that is now. And hopefully our friends on Zoom are seeing the correct thing. Um, so time is of the essence, and I'm sure you have lots of questions. So for our in person, uh, People attending, please make sure to state your name and affiliation and who your question is for. For those of you watching on Zoom, please do the same and use that Q&A feature in the chat. Up here at front, Govert. Hi, uh, Govert Schilling, freelance from the Netherlands. I have actually two questions. One for Jaihan. You showed that the different structures like spheroids and disks were present already in the very early universe. Last week, we also had a University of Texas result of a BART spiral galaxy in a very early universe. How surprising or maybe how worrying is this find and, and what, what does it mean? And related to that, a question for Hao Ying. Um, you said that it might be likely that our picture of a galaxy formation in the early universe must be revised. What kind of revisions do you think might be necessary to accommodate your results? I guess I, I will start. Um, I think the results are a little bit surprising in that nobody really knew what we would see when we looked at these galaxies with JWST. And from Hubble, we just didn't see much, right? They were they were smudges if they were visible at all. Um, from simulations, from cosmological simulations, we know that galaxies should have disks at these high redshift. So we're not surprised to see them. I think the surprise is to see so many of them, to see that things were already, you know, fairly mature at these very high redshifts. And so we're really not seeing the earliest stages of galaxy formation yet. And the results showing bars at higher redshift is sort of another confirmation of this, because we didn't expect necessarily to see so many bars early on. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, this is a great one. So I think that um, the picture, well, first, first of all, uh, we need to accept, well, if our result is true, and I think that uh, the results from multiple, multiple teams that are now starting to uh, converge, I think that we need, one thing that we need to revise in particular is that the galaxies, they were formed very much earlier than we thought previously. Uh, so that's number one. And number two is that, uh, well, there are way more galaxies um, formed in the very early universe. I think that's number two. And uh, this would uh, lead to a lot of consequences, which I don't think uh, we should be discussing here. But, but in any case, uh, is, that is you know, related to fundamentally how early universe can make galaxies. Yeah. 
All right, um, got Nadia with a question here. Thank you. This is uh, Nadia Drake with National Geographic. Um, and along the lines of Govert's question, I wanted to ask James as well, um, are these peas weird? What are they telling us about galaxies in the early universe? And then more generally, um, we heard from Jane Rigby this morning that JWST is redefining redshift or high redshift. And so I'm curious, what is the definition of high redshift at this point? What counts? Is Z3 still high redshift? Is it Z8? Is it Z11? Um, what are we looking at there? Uh, and then a last question for Jehan, and I'm sorry about this, my PhD is in genetics. And so I don't understand um, what rest frame optical means. Um, what is that telling us and how is it different from rest frame UV? I'm sorry, that's a lot of questions. Okay, so I'll start then. So are peas weird? Um, they're unusual, they're interesting, they're a lot of fun to study. And in the nearby universe, they're quite rare. Um, we've been studying them because there have been reasons to suspect they're good analogs of the early universe galaxies for a number of years, based largely on comparisons of size and line strengths, and before JWST, based mostly on the ultraviolet comparisons that we've been able to do. Um, so in this day and age, perhaps they are a bit weird, but that's because perhaps they're a little bit like living fossils of earlier modes of galaxy formation, which we find to be more common in the early universe, coelacanths, if you will. Um, and what is high redshift? Well, that's been a moving target throughout my career, and JWST has certainly moved the goalposts further out. Um, I think the redshift eight and a half galaxy we studied is still a high redshift galaxy in my books, but it may be that the redshift four and a half galaxies that we studied when I was uh, a newly minted postdoc are just intermediate today. I think I'll leave it there. <laughs> okay, so uh, going to the question about what rest frame optical means and why it's important. We like to observe galaxies all across the spectrum if we can, because we get different physical information at different wavelengths. So for example, when we observe nearby galaxies in, in the visible, like with Hubble, we're seeing sort of the, the older stellar population. We're looking at light from all of the stars and we can see what the general structure of galaxies is like. If we look at the UV light instead, we're seeing only the stars that emit strongly in the UV. So that tends to be the really massive, really young stars, but we don't see the overall population. You might see really accurate Active regions of star formation. So when we look at galaxies at higher redshift, you know, where that light is shifted <laughs> to, to longer wavelengths. So if we want to look at a galaxy at redshift five and compare it to what we know at redshift zero, we then have to look at different wavelengths to compare. So by saying we're looking at the rest frame optical, we're really looking at near infrared light to see what, what we would see in the optical in the nearby universe is what we can do in apples to apples comparison. Uh, yeah, Monica. I'm Monica Yang with uh, Sky and Telescope. This is a question for Dr. Yan. Um, I was wondering, first of all, if you have a timeline for when the spectroscopic confirmations might come in. I, I realize this might take some time. And then uh, my other question was, if you're willing to speculate, um, uh, does the idea of galaxies forming earlier than we thought, does that play into the role of dark matter or what we're expecting dark matter to do in the early universe? Uh Thank you. That's also a very great question. But um, it's a, well, the, your first part is um, difficult to answer because this is really up to the uh, the tech, the telescope time, time allocation committee for um, JWST cycle two. But one thing I can say is that when there are actually some kind of uh, confirmation, but not in this field uh, from a different team, uh, although they didn't push to that uh, far away yet. Uh, but it seems like, you know, we really have confirmation of uh, Z larger than 11 galaxies in other fields. So that's number one. So we are on a very promising track. Uh, let me put it that way. And in the second part of your question, uh, which is even more difficult to answer, really, that is uh, regarding uh, how dark matter can, um, you know, really luminous matters can uh, form stars within dark matter. Hey, hello. Uh, I'm not a theorist. Uh, I'm an observer. So um, the only thing that I can say is that uh, we probably will have to uh, make our theorist uh, to go with the observational facts. And I think they are pretty good at it uh, based on the historical records. Um, hi, uh, this is a question for Dr. Yan, kind of similar to the previous question. Um, what exactly would the criteria be for confirming 
um, the high redshift galaxies? Are you planning on observing more with James Webb or are you trying to link up with other with data from other telescopes um, or just having other teams look at the same sort of data? How exactly does that go into confirmation? Uh, the confirmation really is the spectroscopic confirmation. Right now, we are only searching for candidate galaxies by imaging, by looking at the images. So we need to disperse their light into spectrum um, and you know into spectra and uh, try to identify, really see the break, uh, whether this kind of break is consistent with uh, what we see. And you know, ideally, we would like to see all those emission lines or absorption line. Well, absorption line probably are not a way to go, but emission lines, very strong emission line, we can unambiguously say, okay, so this is that line, uh, and, and uh, we can calculate the redshift based on this. But uh, for that high redshift, all those are very fine, uh, you know, very nice lines, they are pretty much out of our reach uh, at the moment. So, uh, but, so the only hope is to really say for uh, something, you know, really uh, certain that uh, uh, this is uh, such a high redshift, really rely on Lemon. I'm on break. Great. Let's hear from Ethan. And then I know there was another question over here on the other side of the room. All right. I, I actually have a few I want to ask. Is it okay to ask more than one? I'll give you no more than three. <laughs> we'll do exactly three. Uh, the first one is for uh, Vivian. Oh, sorry. This is Ethan Siegel of Start to the Bang on Big Think. Uh, for Dr. Yu, uh, I want to know one of the mysteries that, as far as I know, hasn't been completely solved is exactly how the ring structures we see in ring galaxies like Hogue objects, uh, how they form and what their full suite of properties are. I want to know if these JWST findings that you're seeing uh, can shed any light about what we think is happening because of the ring structures you're seeing about ring galaxies in general. Uh, for Jehan, I'm a little curious. Um, we heard a press conference at the previous AAS meeting uh, just a few months ago about um, results from the Refine survey, results from the Candle survey, and they were talking about how at Z greater than two, most galaxies are peculiar, which is kind of consistent with what you're finding that at Z from three to nine, about 40 to 50% are irregular. Um, and the speculation was, is this because of mergers at these very high red shifts? Are there more galaxies merging together? Is that what's triggering star formation? Uh, and another question that came up was, are the peculiars we see in the process of merging and were they disk-like before that? And I'm curious if now that we have JWST data, if you have answers to those questions. And my last question is for Dr. Yan. I trust a photometric redshift about as much as I trust a photo of the Loch Ness Monster. <laughs> um, and that, that might be fair or unfair, but I'm curious because we don't have spectroscopy for SMAX 0723, but we do have it for jades, which exist. They have photometry and they have spectroscopy. They have a field on the sky and they have a known number of identified Z11 or greater objects. If you took the jades rate at what they found and you applied it to your field, how many of your 87 candidate galaxies would you expect are genuinely robust as opposed to false positives because they're red and dusty, et cetera? Did I do okay? Yeah, you guys got all that? <laughs> oh, yeah. Great. I got my part. Yeah. Well. Um, I guess I can start answering that. So it's a. am going to start from answering a more specific uh, situation and before I generalize. So I think you asked a great question, even though I talked about black holes and how that influenced the, the galaxies, I did talk about the star formation ring. And so what we understand from these star formation rings is obviously you have the neutral gas of uh, hydrogen coming in and then they get compressed somehow and then they form molecular gas and then that gets compressed into further um, clouds, molecular clouds in, from which to form stars. And so, but how that actually forms, we, you know, we, there are different ways of doing it. I'm going to specifically say, you know, in 7469, which is a kind of emerging system, and also we see a lot of things happening in the center. You know, what one plausible scenario is that when we see these shocks that, that, um, the outflow, the winds that I'm talking about compresses. It's one way to compress those 
clouds into something that would be shocked and 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 more dense than than they previously were. So that's potentially, you know, how that could be a way to um, form stars, and you you cause um, the the star formation to be happening. And an evidence of that is that. JWST is now showing us, you know, in the in the picture I show with the very red um, uh, filaments, so to speak, along those dust lanes, is that previously we couldn't see what's behind the dust, but maybe these things are being compressed behind the dust, and they're sites of where star formation is now happening. And also in the in the general systems that I study, the galaxy mergers, a lot of these happen either in you know regions that maybe the the galaxies are happening, they're they're compacting each other, or maybe even like their tidal streams. And then that's where you know a lot of these um, gases being compressed either through shocks or other merger induced uh, uh, mechanisms and that, that might be forming stars. So in general then that hopefully you know answers your question about how these um, we might be starting to understand how star formation could happen either in a ring shape or along these tidal arms and, and tidal structures. Okay, peculiar galaxies. So peculiar galaxies, they're near and dear to my heart because I'm very interested in mergers and what happens when galaxies merge. And I think one of the things we've learned from surveys like candles and others is that galaxies can be peculiar but for a lot of different reasons. And some of them are peculiar because they're merging and, and you can see that because you see two objects or you see tidal tails. Um, but sometimes you don't see those signatures. And it's hard to know if you don't see them because they're not there or because they're too faint and they are and they're just out of our out of our field. So JWST, I think, is really going to help us see those features much better than we could before. Um, we can't yet, we haven't yet been able to quantify, you know, how many of these things are actually mergers. I will say, looking at the images, we see mergers galore. It's it's gorgeous. We see mergers happening everywhere. Um, but it's probably not the case that everything that's peculiar is a merger, right? Because there's a lot of other stuff going on. Um, the gas is very turbulent. There's other things that can give you that that sort of clumpy, um, asymmetric type of structure. And so, you know, so far with just Sears, it's been it's been the tip of the iceberg. We really need these wider area surveys that are getting started to really really quantify um, how much mergers are impacting these objects. All right, so regarding your question, uh, so okay, first of all, I wanted to start by saying that I don't like photometric redshift either, okay? <laughs> uh, that's a, well, that's just something that I have to use. And uh, photometric redshift being consistent with our expectation can, can, can never be taken as a confirmation. It's just yeah, another kind of a support evidence, but uh, it's definitely not a confirmation. Are you good with that? Um, yeah. All right. Okay. So number two, regarding J's, uh, this is what I uh, uh, also mentioned. There are some kind of a confirmation already, uh, but not in our, our field, but in some di different field. I was referring to J's. And uh, this, uh, they and they didn't go to as uh, high redshift as uh, in our selection. But I, uh, I would say that this is already a very promising uh, confirmation, a very promising evidence showing that, uh, you know, this really shows that uh, uh, the universe were, uh, you know, were having was having uh, really so many young galaxies, uh, so many early galaxies, much earlier and much more abundant than we previously uh, thought. Okay, so that's not number two. And uh, regarding uh, how we can best use their uh, confirmation to gauge the uh, success rate of our candidates, well, I cannot say it for certain yet because uh, they do not, uh, they didn't show how many uh, in my, if I remember this correctly, they didn't show well, how many candidates they uh, selected for, spectros uh, for spectroscopy. They only selected the most promising ones. I'm sure of that. But uh, you know, you know, selecting how many out of uh, uh, how many, uh, this is still something that we do not know. Uh, so it'll it'll take a while to to do this kind of comparison. But I would say that uh, I'll bet uh, twenty bucks and a <laughs> and a beer, a very tall one that uh, the success rate uh, ought to be larger than 50%. Yeah. I will buy you a beer at the yard house at the next <laughs> meeting. Oh, there you go. All right. Excellent. OK, I know we have some questions from online. I'm so sorry. We have far more questions than we can get to. Ben, would you like to read one of those to us? And then I know we're going to run over a smidge. So if you have to scoot, I understand. Sure, we have one from Shannon Hall at Nature uh, for Dr. Rhodes. Of, can you explain how these early green pea-like galaxies relate to cosmic reionization? Okay, that's a great question. So when we look at green peas in the nearby universe, um, 
there are several groups who have found that they have a large fraction of galaxies that emit an unusually large number of ionizing photons compared with most other nearby galaxies. And this is really the power of using green peas as analogs of high redshift galaxies. This is a study that you actually have to do nearby because the gas in the intergalactic medium stops you from measuring the ionizing radiation escaping directly at high redshift. But what we learned from seeing that these early galaxies are like green peas is that um, the chance that they're emitting a relatively large amount of ionizing radiation is pretty good, given that their best nearby analogs do that. And therefore, yes, this helps us explain how the universe reionized, because it nails down one of the most uncertain parameters controlling when the gas between galaxies went from neutral to ionized. We've known for a long time that that's somewhere between redshift 6 and 10 or 11. We're nailing it down closer and closer, and um, I think this is an important piece of the puzzle. Awesome. Okay. Well, I think I'm going to cut things off there. I apologize to our remaining online viewers who weren't able to get their questions answered. Um, we will start with you at our next press conference. Um, let's thank all of our wonderful speakers one more time. And thanks as well to all of you for joining, to our PIOs who prepared press releases for this, and of course, press officer Susanna Kohler, who couldn't be here today, but without her months of work, we would not be here. Um, and we will see you back here today at 2.15 to hear about mergers, bursts, and jets. Thank you, everybody.